Today we're going to talk about what Jesus said was the most important thing that we do as Christians, and that's love. And I was originally scheduled to preach the Sunday before Valentine's Day, so everything was kind of scheduled out perfectly. This was the sermon I wanted to preach. We're preaching about love. The Sunday before Valentine's Day, fantastic. It's all going to work out. Strep throat caused some uh, change in plans, Um, and I appreciate Pastor Steve filling in for me last month. But now I'm stuck with, I mean blessed with, the, the, maybe the worst Sunday in the entire year to try and preach, and that's the Sunday after y'all just lost an hour of sleep. So you come, you're more tired, you're more grouchy, even more grouchy than normal, um, and, and that much more prone to falling asleep. And it's not like, so the guy up here on the platform, I'm kind of limited in what I can do as far as keeping you awake. It's not like I can like go get a chair and jump up on top and start dancing around and jump off screaming or anything like that, because who does that when they preach, right? I do, and they still invite me back to do this again. I don't know why. I don't know. Um, But I do have a plan, so I'm not going to dance. And ever since you guys have heard over the past week that that I would be preaching this Sunday, the most popular question to ask Pastor Michael this week is, will you be dancing on a chair? No, um, not this time. I did that um, and wasn't planning on it anyways, but yesterday at Children's Ministry Day, I kind of got the wind taken out of my sails as far as my dance moves. Um, we, were, we were worshiping, and there were some moves to go along with the songs, and, and Jackson Height challenged me to a dance competition as we were following the moves, and a lot on the line, the winner get to, got to drive the church van home, and I lost. Um, but luckily, he couldn't reach the pedals, so that was all good, and he went ahead and he let me drive home anyways. Uh, so we made it home safely, had a great day yesterday at Children's Ministry Day, but again, my confidence is, is, is lacking today on my dance move. But I do have a plan. I'm going to use the same approach that my two-year-old son, Simon, he uses this approach with me. Anytime he sees me dozing off or, or if we're playing around and I like fake snore or real snore, he, he comes and gets right up in my face and he just yells at the top of his lungs. He goes, wake up! See, I'm learning. I didn't even make you like turn the sound off that time. I didn't actually scream. But that's what's happening. So you've been warned. We're going to call you out this morning if I catch you dozing, okay? So I'm coming at you. We'll crank the sound up. We'll wake you up. But, but I don't think we're going to have to do that because, again, we're talking about what Jesus said is the most important thing that we do as Christians, and that's love. And where I'm getting that, we're going to start our first scripture verse or, or passage is going to come out of Matthew chapter 22. And Jesus is asked a question, and we're going to look at his response. The question is this, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So Jesus is asked, What's the most important thing that we do? And his answer is simple, It's love. And he kind of goes into two different ways that we love. We love God and we love, love people. So we're going to kind of cram two sermons into one today. So a lot of material. Buckle up. I've already apologized to our signer. We've got a lot of stuff to cover. And, and it may be an aerobic exercise for her this morning to keep up with me. Um, but we've got a lot of material to cover. And we're going to jump in with another verse. We're going to look in John chapter 15. And this first part of our sermon is about how do we love God? What does it look like to love God? How do we show that we love God? And what type of relationship is God calling us into, actually? So in John chapter 15, I'm going to start in verse 9. This is the words of Jesus. So this is like the teacher giving us the answer sheet before we take the test, telling us exactly what we need to know, exactly what we need to do. Again, this is Jesus speaking. John chapter 15, starting in verse 9. Jesus says this, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. I'm going to skip to verse 17. Jesus continues, These things I command you so that that you will love 
one another. We can continue to see this theme of, of love God and love our neighbor as ourself and love other people. We're going to use this passage and specifically look at how do we love God. Well, in verse 10 and again in verse 14, Jesus tells us that if we love God, we will do what? We will follow his commandments. Now, please don't hear me say that being a Christian or, or being a believer of God is about this list of rules that we have to follow or about this list of rules that's a burden to us. That's not what I'm saying. Jesus emphasizes in, in verse 11, he says, he tells us these things not to be a burden to us, but so that we can have joy and that our joy will be full. He talks about he, the, this heavenly father concept. And, you know, yes, we have commandments that God expects us to follow, but in a loving way, God doesn't give commandments to be a burden. We don't have a God who, who's this like killjoy master in the sky, like do this, do that. And, and if we don't, we get like a Hulk smash or something like that when we don't. That's not what it's about. But God's giving us these commandments to help us live a better life. Our Heavenly Father loves us enough to tell us no. He loves us enough to give us some expectations that if we follow these expectations, that'll help us grow and mature as people. He gives us some rules to keep us safe, and he gives us a lot of wisdom and a lot of advice on how to live a better life here. That's what the commandments are about, not to be a burden, but to be a joy for us. You know, in this passage, Jesus uses the term father. He also uses the term friend, and, and that's awesome that we get to be friends with God. Like, I got no amens on we get to see this is what I'm talking about on like the Sunday after you lost an hour of sleep because we get to be friends with like the creator of the universe. This is awesome. And, and this term friend, I don't want to kind of get mixed up on what it means because when I hear friend, I hear like buddy and, and equal. This term friend, Jesus isn't saying that we're equal with God. God is still God and we are not. Okay, but this term friend more precisely translated, and if we look at the original word, how Jesus used it in context and in his culture, this word friend that he uses actually more, more precisely describes, so like there's a king, and then he surrounds himself with this inner circle of people whom he trusts, and he spends time with, and he knows them, and they know him, and those people around him he calls his friends. That's what Jesus is telling. In a modern day context, it reminds me of a few of my former bosses that I've had um, and the relationship that I had with them. Mr. Lark, my principal at Beecher City, I worked a summer for Dwayne Martin. I worked a summer for Eric Tucker. And all three of those guys, as I worked with them, I considered them friends. We would talk about personal stuff. I knew what was going on in their families. They knew what was going on in my families. We knew each other personally outside of work. We also had conversations about work. My principal would talk to me about what direction we're going as a school and why we do things the way that we do. Dwayne and Eric, the same thing. They would talk about this is where my company's going and my future plans. And, and all three of those guys would allow me to make suggestions and would allow me to, to make requests. And sometimes the answer was yes, and sometimes the answer was no. But at the end of the day, they were my boss, and I had to submit to that authority. But it didn't lessen the fact that we were friends. See, that's the type of relationship that Jesus is telling us we can have with God. Yes, he's still in charge. Yes, we still submit to him. But he wants to know us on an intensely close, personal level. And we get that relationship with God. Jesus emphasizes the word friend by contrasting with the word servant or slave. He said, we are no longer slaves just obeying the master and not knowing what's going on. But we know God and God knows us. And we obey his commands because we love God. And we know that God loves us and he has good things in store for us. And that he has our best interests in mind. So what does it look like to love God? How do we love God? We obey his commandments. What type of relationship are we called into with God? We're called into an intensely close, personal relationship with God. God wants to have that relationship with every single one of us, with you, with me, with every single one of us. He wants that relationship. So that's part one. How do we love God and what does that look like? Part two, how do we love other people? We're going we're gonna to go to another passage of Scripture. This time we're going to be in Luke. Sorry. Yep. We're going to be in Luke chapter 10. And we're going to look at the story of the Good Samaritan. And some of you may have heard the story of the Good Samaritan. Some of you maybe not. But as we read through, again, our focus here is how do we love our neighbor as ourself? How do we love other people? So we're looking for how do we apply what Jesus is trying to teach us in this moment? Again, the words of Jesus coming, coming to us. How do we apply those words to us today? So in Luke chapter 10, I'm going to start in verse 25. 
says this, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? The man answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But the man desiring to justify himself said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? The man said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. So go and do likewise. So what are we supposed to go and do? How do we love our neighbor as ourself? Well, I'm going to pick out five things that I see in the passage that we read, and this is not intended to be a complete or exhaustive list on every single thing that we do to love people. I don't have time. I have time for one passage, so we're going to look at this passage and what specific five things that I see in this passage on how we love our neighbor as ourself and how we love the people around us. Number one, we love people by noticing them and caring enough to stop and help. As I was writing this sermon, that one kind of hurts a little bit personally. See, to me, when I'm I'm looking at this, it kind of gives me that same feeling I have with Caroline, my four-year-old daughter. When I say, Caroline, we don't talk like that. And she says, but you said it. Hmm, that hurts. Now, I like that conversation when I say, Caroline, we don't talk like that. And she says, but Nana and Papa said it. And it's like, that's right, they did, okay? (laughs) They're not very good people. We're going to stay away from them. Um, But, no, they're great. They're great with my kids, and, and I appreciate what they do. But, um, but when it's but but you said it, it's that kind of personal jab. Like I'm I'm trying to tell someone else to do something that I'm not very good at. I'll admit that that this is a struggle for me at times because I'm I'm a very task oriented and very goal oriented person. Whether I have it written down on a piece of paper or whether it's just in my head, every day I have a to do list of what I need to get done that day or that week or month or whatever the case may be. And depending on what's that list, whether it's the sheer number of things on that list that stresses me out, or whether I have one big thing, like trying to prepare a sermon, if there's one thing on my list that's stressing me out, I can tend to get kind of tunnel visioned. And I tend to not see and not notice the things that go on around me because I'm so focused on what I've got going on. And, and even worse, there are times where I'm so focused on my own thing that I notice what's going on. I just don't want to be inconvenienced and I want to get done what I feel like I need to get done. So I'll admit that this one's a struggle for me, but I do think, and and it's one of my goals this year, and one of the things that I've talked about trying to get better at in 2019 is this concept of slowing down and walk slowly. So slow down and walk slowly so that I can notice people, notice their needs, and I can care enough to stop and take care of those needs. I think the first way in this story that we see of loving other people is that we notice them and we care enough to stop. Number two, we love People or we're called to love people that aren't like us and even those that don't like us. See, the man laying at the side of the road was a Jewish man, and the man that finally stopped and helped him was a Samaritan. A little cultural and and, and historical background here. The Jewish culture and, and the Samaritans, they didn't get along. They didn't look the same, they didn't act the same, they didn't dress the same, they didn't they didn't believe the same things. They were completely different cultures, and those cultures did not intermingle. They didn't have dealings with each other. They didn't like each other. And yet when a Samaritan sees this Jewish man, he puts all of those differences aside. And he says, it doesn't matter that I'm not like you or that you don't like me. You're in need and I'm going to help you. I think we're called to love people that are different than us and people that don't like us. Number three on my list. So we're called to love, to notice people and care enough to stop. We're called to love people that aren't like us and that don't like us. Number three, I think we're called to love sacrificially. The Samaritan stops. He risks his own life 
on an obviously dangerous portion of this road, risks his own life, he uses his own materials, he, he uses his own financial resources to provide for this man. He sacrifices his own time. Whatever else was going on the rest of the day, he gave up all of that and spent the day taking care of this man. I think God blesses us with a lot of things. He blesses us with talents and skills and abilities. He blesses us with time, with resources, with possessions. And I think he expects us to use those for the good and not just the good of ourselves, but for the good of other people as well. Number four on my list is that we love thoroughly and we follow up. See, the Samaritan didn't just go help the man up, just just give him a hand up, give him a pat on the back and say good luck. No, he took care of his wounds. He took care of his immediate wounds, and then he took him back to the inn, and and he took care of him. So he continued to follow up with this guy and continued this process of caring and taking care of, and then he left money to provide for future needs, and he assured them that he was coming back and he was going to follow up to make sure that, that this man was taken care of. You know, when, when I think of loving other people, a lot of times I get these like one-time random acts of kindness type things that float into my head, and those are absolutely appropriate, and I hope we do those things. But when we truly care and we're truly loving for someone else, we love thoroughly, and, and we walk right along with them as they're struggling and as they're getting better, and we continue to care for them, and we follow up afterwards to make sure that they're okay. Number six, and the first, sorry, number five, I originally had six, and I'm going to be close in time, so I cut one and kind of intermingled it in with another one. But number five um, doesn't even come from the story of the Good Samaritan. I'm going to back up and look before Jesus ever even tells this story. What is his initial response? He's asked a question, and Jesus says, what does the law say? Well, the law is the Old Testament. That's Scripture. Jesus is, is modeling for us that we love other people by pointing them to God's truths. And I don't know that there's any more important way or more significant way that we could love other people than to point them towards God's truths. And and I I told you, I know I'm going to be close on time, but I have to stop and I have to to talk about some of the young people in our church. Yesterday, we went to Children's Ministry Day. We had a group of kids making cookies and making care packages. They gave up a Saturday and they they were serving God and they were loving other people. And yes, I know that that was just a one day thing. But they gave up their Saturday, they gave up what they were going to do, and they were showing people love, and they were serving other people. And I had a lot of fun yesterday serving with that group of kids. And again, I know it was a one-time thing, but I hope that 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 passion and, and that love for serving other people is something that continues to grow in them and continues to develop for a lifetime of loving people and serving people. I have to brag on some of our older kids as well. In the youth group in 2019, we are focusing, our leaders and myself, challenging or challenging ourselves and we're challenging our students to share the gospel we're challenging our students to have gospel focused bible focused god focused conversations with our friends and those around us with the hope that that we will have the opportunity to share to boldly and clearly share the gospel with the people around us that's our goal this week i had two girls in class they had two minutes left at the end of class and this wasn't a planned presentation wasn't a planned talk or anything it was a conversation about ribs and those two girls were able to take that conversation about ribs and turn it into telling their friends and telling their peers about how god created the entire universe he created everything in it he created people he created adam and then he created eve from adam's rib i couldn't be more proud of those girls right there and being able to turn that conversation and take opportunities to point people towards God's truths. Because again, I don't think there's any way that we can love people more significantly than telling them about the truths of God. So my last thing I'm going to do before before I get off the platform, I'm going to do the most loving thing I know to do for y'all, and I'm going to share what I believe about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe that God created the entire universe. I believe that he created everything in it. I believe that God created all people. He created you and he created me. And he didn't create us just to exist, but like we talked about earlier, God created us with a desire and an intent. Every single one of us would have this close personal relationship with him. But see, there's a problem. See, God is holy and he is perfect and that's not the problem. The problem is us and the problem is sin. Sin is when we disobey God's commandments. And sin is anything that separates us from God. And our sin causes this separation between us and God that we can't overcome. And every single one of us has done that and has caused this separation. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You have fallen short, I have fallen short. Every one of us has. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. 
one sin, the wages for that sin is death. And yes, a physical death, but an eternal death in a literal place called hell where you will spend eternity apart from the presence of God. But Romans 6.23 doesn't stop right there. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but then it follows out the good news. It says, but the free gift of God, the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And, and I believe that Jesus came and he died for your sins and for my sins. He came from heaven down to earth. He lived as a man. Jesus, he lived a perfect, sinless life. At the end of his life, he was brutally tortured. He was hung on a cross where he died in the greatest act of love ever demonstrated ever in all time. And after he died on the cross, he was buried. He was put in a tomb. And on the third day, he rose from the grave. He overcame death and eventually ascended up into heaven where he currently resides. And he lives and he resides right at the right hand of the Father. And through those actions, you and I can have eternity with God in a place called heaven, an eternity of life. Romans 5.8 says that God demonstrates his love and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. John 3.16 says God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. See, it's a free gift of God and all we have to do is believe. All we have to do is put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ and we believe that his death on the cross was enough to pay for your sins and you get to spend eternity in heaven. Romans 10.9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You know, if you've never made that decision, I, I would invite you to make it this morning. You can leave this morning knowing exactly what would happen if you died tonight, where you would spend tomorrow, and where you would spend the rest of eternity. And I would encourage you that if you don't know the answer to that question, or if you can't confidently say that if I died tonight, I'm going to heaven, I encourage you to, to come talk to me, come talk to one of the other pastors, some of the other members, we'd love to share it with you. Go talk to one of the youth kids, I've been challenging them to share it. Talk to us and don't leave without having the answer to that question. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. If there's some way that you need to respond, I invite you to do that. And for those of us that have already made that commitment, that have already entered into that friendship with God that started whenever we made that decision and lasts forever and lasts for eternity, it gives us one more opportunity to worship that God who loved you enough to die for you and to pay the cost for your sins. Let's stand and let's sing.